My name is John. I'm a pastor here at Grace Snellville. I was gone last week. We were teaching with our team, Jesus and the Quran training in Arizona with a church. It went really well. And I watched, got up early in Phoenix and watched the 9 a.m. service last Sunday. It seems like you guys had a really sweet time of worship also. And we're going to keep moving forward in the Gospel of John. So if you have your Bibles, open them to John chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, slip up your hand. We'll put a Bible in your hand, and you're going to need it because we're going to be reading some Bible, like every Sunday here at Grace. And uh, you need a sheet for notes. You can get one of those also. But as we've seen in these opening chapters, the great Gospel of John begins with the overview that the Word who was with God and was God became flesh and dwelt among us, And he reveals the glory of God, Jesus revealing the glory of God, full of grace and truth. And we've seen how Jesus continues to bring grace and truth as he calls disciples, supplies the wine at the wedding, making the water into wine, cleansing the temple, bringing that truth into that place. And then in John chapter 3, Jesus begins encountering these people. And the first conversation he has is with a man named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, he's trying to make it in the world by keeping the rules and basically by being a good person. It's amazing to me how many people I meet whose goal in life is to just kind of make it by being a good person. I'm going to do the best I can. And Jesus, rather shockingly, says, you know, Nicodemus, even though you're trying real hard, it's not, it's not what God desires. What has to happen is that you be born again by trusting me. As we keep reading further, the next person Jesus meets in John chapter 4 is that Samaritan woman. She's trying to make it in the world by finding the right relationship. She's gone through five husbands. She's with a man, her sixth, who's not really her husband. But she's trying to make it in the world. If I could just get that right relationship, if I could find the right person who will save me or who will actually bring happiness. And Jesus, with her, points out through grace and truth, no, 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 what you're really searching for is me. I'm the one who can teach you to be a true worshiper in spirit and in truth. And then in John chapter 5, we meet the man by the pool of Bethesda who's an invalid. He can't move. He's ill. And he is perhaps the most pathetic of all. Each chapter kind of gets worse and worse. This guy, when Jesus asks him if he wants to get well, he doesn't even say yes. He just says, I'm all alone. I can't get to the water. He's not even trying to make it through life anymore. He, he's pretty much just given up. And yet Jesus heals him, says, take up your mat, go, walk. And then, of course, even this guy sort of trying to work out who Jesus is and eventually meets up with Jesus a little bit later. And when he meets with Jesus, Jesus says, hey, don't keep sinning unless something worse happens to you. It's a very, very interesting little story. And there in John 5, as Randy preached so powerfully last week, if Jesus comes to this guy who is alone, given up, can't move at all in life at all, if Jesus comes to this guy, where will he not come? Who will he not show up to? Jesus will go into every situation. And at the end of John chapter five, after this miraculous healing by the pool of Bethesda, there's a long sort of sermon where Jesus begins to unpack what it means that he's come in grace and truth to the people around And the big point of that sermon is that Jesus represents God to us. Jesus himself says there that I only do what I see the Father doing. He says, I'm the one who can give life. He says, I'm the one who God has authorized to be the judge. And the Jews are put off by this. They're not only upset that he's healing on the Sabbath, but also that he's making himself equal with God. And so that whole sermon sort of summarizes those first five chapters of how Jesus is representing God to us. How Jesus is showing us how God comes to people who are trying to make it in life by being good people, and he comes to people who aren't even trying in life to make it at all. He comes to everybody the same and says, come to me, come to me that you might be made whole. But then in chapter six, we get to sort of a different side A new perspective. After chapter 5 concludes with how Jesus represents God to us, chapter 6 unpacks how we are to receive Jesus. 
How do we receive Jesus? And the answer here in John 6 is very simple, but it's also very challenging. And what we see is from the beginning of John 6 all the way down to the end, Jesus slowly winnows away the people. Same simple message through the whole chapter, but fewer and fewer by the very end, only 12 are still there, still walking with Jesus as he gives this answer about how he wants to be received. And as Jesus is communicating what it means to receive him, he taps into a sensation or an experience that is common to all of us. He talks a lot about hunger. When was the last time you were really hungry? It might be right now. You might have gotten up this morning a little bit later than you thought. You didn't eat much breakfast, and now you're going, man, I hope he finishes soon. I'm starving. <laughs> Have you ever done this? Have you ever gotten to church, and you realize you didn't eat any breakfast, and so you start looking in your bag, like, maybe I've got a mint in here, <laughs> Some, just a little bit of sugar, you know, to kind of tide me through? Because where else do you sit in a room and listen to somebody talk for this long in your life? I do that sometimes. Sometimes I get here on Sunday morning, oh, I forgot to eat, and I'm looking through, and I'm like, hmm, one lifesaver mint. This is gonna have to be the grace of God that gets me through. <laughs> hunger, it's, it's common to all of us. We know about hunger. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about food. We make lists, and we go buy food. We think about food. We prepare food. Sometimes we grow our own food. Occasionally, some people more than others will, will, will post pictures of their food online. <laughs> Especially over Valentine's. I notice there are a lot of people online who like to post like, whatever heart-shaped food. It's like, it's still a pizza, even though it's the shape of a heart. <laughs> still a pizza. And, and part of this is because we're just dependent on food. We have to eat. If we don't eat, we starve. And, and at an even deeper level, Jesus is going to be teaching here in John 6 about what it means to really be hungry and what it means to receive him. But just to sort of prime the pump a little bit, I want you to watch a couple of these videos so you have in mind the sort of thing Jesus is gonna be talking about. Let's check this first one out. Hey, Tony, pick it up. I want this whole row finished. You know, I'm just not feeling the wood cutting thing today. Uh... I don't know. Are you done? What is the rush here? Is there like a worldwide shortage of gazebos? Tony, eat a Snickers. Why? Because you get a little bit whiny when you're hungry. Better? Better. Hey! My back hurts! Now my front hurts! You're not you when you're hungry. Snickers satisfies. Hold on, hold on. We got a couple more just so you really get the point. Let's go. So you guys grew up together? Yeah, since third grade. What are you looking at? I'm not looking at it. We're not good enough for you. You look for something else? No, I, just, I don't know. What are you, big it. supermodels? Oh, oh, yeah. Who's us? Ladies. Supermodels? Right. What do you model, gloves? What are you doing? A girl's totally into me. Brad, eat a Snickers. Why? Because you get a little angry when you're hungry. Better? Better. So, ladies. So, loser. Stacy, relax. I'm sorry. You're not you when you're hungry. Snickers satisfies. And, and, and they're 30 seconds, so one more. Let's do one more. Just, I'm enjoying myself. Can we turn the AC up? I'm dying back here. It's on. Can't you feel it? Can you feel that? Oh. <laughs> Jeff, eat a Snickers, please. Why? Every time you get hungry, you turn into a diva. Just eat it so Ooh. we can all coexist. Turn into a diva. Mm -hmm. Put it in your system, cranky pants. Okay. Thank you. Better? Better. Will you get your knees out of the back of my seat? <laughs> you're not you when you're hungry. Snickers satisfies. <laughs> Nobody really knows. Do we applaud Snickers? What do you do with that? It's, it's funny, and I think we've all experienced that in one way or another. The reason it's funny is because it's so often true. When we get hungry, we can turn into monsters. So that's what Jesus is talking about in John 6. Not Snickers, hunger. We'll pick it up in verse 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, the Roman name. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. In just a moment, remember that Passover feast was one of the most important times of the year for the Jewish community. It was commanded by God that they keep this feast 
And at the core of the feast was the remembrance of how God had delivered the people out of slavery in Egypt and into freedom. Of course, the Passover lamb that they slaughtered spared them from the angel of death passing through the town. And then they got out free from Egypt and then they got to the shores of the Red Sea And remember, they turned around and the Pharaoh and the Egyptian soldiers who had let them go free after that final 10th plague changed their minds and were running them down. Literally gonna overrun and slaughter all of the Jewish people. And so God, when they felt like they're totally stuck, Moses had a conversation with God. God said, stretch out your hand over the water and God parted the waters and they passed through the Red Sea into freedom. And then they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years where God provided bread for them. Every day, the manna from heaven, supernatural provision. And so it's important we get that context of what the Passover means. This is the second of three Passovers that's mentioned in the Gospel of John. And the context is really important because it helps us understand. The Passover is all about the bread God provided, the meal that he provided, and the deliverance through the water. It's interesting because in this little chapter, we have the same sort of thing. Jesus providing bread and Jesus providing deliverance through the waters. Verse five says, lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And he said this to test him for he himself knew what he would do. It's very interesting. He asks Philip this question and it's a test. How is Philip receiving Jesus? Philip, one of the disciples, he's been with Jesus for a little while now. How is he responding to Jesus? And what is Jesus looking for in Philip? Is he looking for a good catering plan? Is he asking Philip to scroll through his contacts to see if he knows anybody who can come up with a lot of bread on short notice? No, what he's looking for is faith. Jesus, this is what he's looking for in people all the time. Do do you have any any trust in me? That's what he's looking for. And here's verse seven. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. How does Philip do on his test? Eh, C minus D, F. He gets out his little pocket calculator, basically says, Lord, we don't have the money for this one. And, and, and you know, this is how we see where Philip's trust is. The Lord is saying, hey, where can we get some bread? Where can we buy some bread? And Philip says, well, you know, we don't have money at all to do it. At the end of the day, for him, his world is still limited and defined by how much is in his pocketbook. But what could he have said? What what should he even have said? How might he have passed the test? Well, perhaps if he had said something like, well, Lord, I don't know. We don't have a bunch of money, but we were at this wedding not long ago, and there's some water, and you kind of work that out into wine. What would you do? That's the sort of answer Jesus is looking for. The answer that communicates trust. Well, Jesus, not really sure how to feed all these people. What do you think? You seem to be pretty good with this sort of thing. It's interesting. Sometimes the Lord, like he does here, he'll draw our attention to some of the impossible circumstances of our life just to be a little test to see, will we look to him through it all? Will we put our eyes on him? Or we check our pocketbook and say, ah, this is impossible. Verse eight, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Now, Andrew, he kind of wants to take the test too. He's gonna help work on the problem a little bit. But rather than saying, it's hopeless, we don't have enough money, Andrew says, well, we've got five loaves and two fish. And do you know what? That's enough for Jesus. That's, that's all he takes. It's like he just has a, a little hint, like a mustard seed worth of faith. Got some loaves and some fish. And Jesus said, verse 10, have the people sit down. We can work with this. Now, there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. And it's just counting the men here. So with women, and if the children were not downstairs at Grace Kids, probably altogether it'd be 15, 20,000. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, 
He distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. It's very interesting in verse 11 there, and this is a whole other sermon. But Jesus' miracle of multiplication occurs in an atmosphere of gratitude. The text takes time to point out that he gives thanks first. There are things in your life that you're looking to see multiplied, stuff you need the Lord to grow. Don't look at the absence, but show gratitude for what you do have in that space. Jesus doesn't look at the miserable pittance of food, but the miraculous power of God. He says, hey, this is what we have. Thanks for this much. And then he begins to distribute, and everyone is fed. Verse 12, and when they had eaten their fill, He told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. If if you're at home and your children ever complain about you asking them to make sure all the leftover food gets put into Tupperware and make it into the fridge, just read them this verse. This is Jesus' divine command, keep the leftovers. Why? Well, because these 12 baskets are a sign that that indicate that even though Jesus started with five loaves, he finishes with 12 baskets. His generosity, his power to feed is overabundant. And in this story, it's familiar to us. Actually, it's the only miracle that shows up in all four of the Gospels. But this story, it really is doing two things. The first in John is showing us how Jesus is measuring, checking out, testing even the faith of his disciples. How, how far along have they come? Have they learned to trust me yet? And the other piece of this story that is just so powerful reveals how Jesus loves to feed the hungry. And Jesus sees their need and he's not just interested in their spiritual needs, he's interested in their physical needs. He sees these people are going to need to eat some real food. And so he feeds them. And as we get into this conversation that will become quite spiritual in the second half of John 6, we need to remember Jesus is not just giving some teaching to satisfy the soul. He's working with the entire person. He wants people to be fed body and soul. And as we, who are people aiming to imitate Jesus or follow Jesus, be disciples of Jesus, it's important sometimes just even to ask as we read this story, how do we engage in feeding the hungry? Where do we see the needs around us, people who physically are lacking resources, food? How do we do that? One of my favorite times of year is with kids' life just right about now because it's rice bowl season. I don't know, how how many of you guys have kids in kids' life who brought home some rice bowls in the last couple of, yeah, some of your hands, you know what these are. I think we have a picture, there you go. These little rice bowls are little change collection bowls and all the kids get them and they bring them home and they put all their loose change in them and they bring them back and collect all the money together and the proceeds of whatever we raise goes toward feeding orphan children. It's a beautiful program. And our kids get so excited about it. I just love watching them every Wednesday night come in and track in the rice bowl stuff. In fact, a couple years ago, we had a little girl who was doing the rice bowl challenge and her birthday fell during rice bowl season. And she said, hey, guys, to her friends and to her family, I don't want any gifts. I just want change for my rice bowl. Isn't the heart of a child so beautiful? Of course, there's a competition between guys and girls, so that might have been a little bit of a motivating factor. (laughs) But feeding the hungry, feeding the hungry. What do our kids understand? Well, they see Jesus feeds the hungry, and it's about as simple as that. Yeah, I'd like to be participating in that somehow as well. And then at the end of the time, it's kind of a brittle plastic in the rice bowl, you know? So the last day, everybody brings them in. There's a big barrel, and you smash them down in the barrel, and the change explodes everywhere. And my job is great because my arms are long enough to reach down into the barrel. So if one of the kids throws it down and it doesn't break satisfactorily, then I reach down, do it again. It explodes. And every once in a while, we'll have some kids who come in and they throw them down. They don't break, but they don't really get to watch them break or whatever. So then I get to reach in and break one. 
it's so fun. Anyway, sorry, I got kind of carried away there in the rice bowl thing. But you think that's just a simple piece. What, what good does it do? Even maybe like Philip, we're kind of going, well, yeah, but we don't really have mo- enough money to make a difference or dent in any of this. And what happens? Well, last year, our kids put together enough rice bowl change to be able to provide 13,626 meals. How does the Lord multiply that? Yeah, amen. Bless the Lord for that. You think, oh, all you've got is a couple loaves. Well, the Lord works. Verse 14, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is interesting because Jesus is, in fact, the king. He's the rightful king. He's come to announce the kingdom. But he notices that the people who want to make him king are not motivated by the plans of God, but they actually just want Jesus to do whatever they want him to do, namely provide bread all the time. They think, hey, this guy's got this little trick with the bread. He'd be a great king because then he can just keep giving us bread. They want to politicize this whole kingdom because they think Jesus can just print more bread. I mean, make more bread. (laughs) Verse 16, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat and they were frightened. We just sang that beautiful song with this passage in mind. And just something to notice here. As they're trying to cross the water, the wind comes up, and what's emphasized is even though they're straining and straining, they're not going anywhere. They're totally stuck. Have you ever felt that in your life? It feels like you're just straining, you're working as hard as you can, and no movement is happening, you're just stuck? I think we're all familiar with that. I love these words that describe Jesus. While the disciples are stuck, Jesus is walking on the sea and coming near the boat. Jesus is moving at will when they are not moving at all. When they feel stuck, Jesus is not stuck. Jesus is moving. Sometimes it feels like we're stuck. But the Lord, he's still moving. The Lord's still at work. And actually, as Kirby was saying, the Lord wants to draw near to us. He wants to be close to us in our time of stuckness. Great commentator, Herman Ritterboss, about this passage said, this story should convince the disciples that in virtue of the glory given him by God, no darkness was too deep, no waves were too high, no sea was too wide for him to find them and be with them in the midst of that tumult. Jesus, again, he's teaching his disciples, you can trust me. You feel stuck. You feel like you're in the storm. You feel like you're about to drown. You can trust me. Verse 20, he said to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. This is one of those details. If you're reading quickly, you might just go over it. But if you pause and think about it, you kind of wonder, how did that work? Immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going? Was this like a Star Trek beam me up sort of moment? As soon as they welcome Jesus in the boat, it's like, and they're there? Or is it just that the boat moved really fast? You know, Jesus gets in and it's like, Zoom. we don't know exactly, but the point is quite beautiful, isn't it? They're stuck Jesus comes to them, they receive him, they welcome him in, and they're not stuck anymore. I love this about Jesus. He's not just waiting on the far side of the shore going, hey guys, work real hard, and when you get over here, I'll be waiting for you. He comes out onto the sea, says, let me. It is I, don't be afraid, let me. And it is, it's scary sometimes. It's scary when we've been working really hard at something, we feel stuck then Jesus is like, hey, can I get in the boat? And he's walking on the water. You know, this can blow our minds. What would it mean to actually trust Jesus in some of the circumstances we've been laboring at for such a long time? 
people we've been bitter against, challenging relationships, raising our children. Sometimes we've been struggling at that, we feel stuck. And to actually listen, receive, and trust Jesus and do what he says in those times is scary. But when they welcome him gladly into the boat, whew, they arrive. Now, verse 22, on the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. They're trying to put together the pieces. How did he get to the other side? Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. There's that gratitude again. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boat and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus said, oh, since about Christmas. <laughs> See, the questions in John typically function on multiple levels. There's the just obvious level question, like how did you get to this side of the lake? But there's a deeper question. When did you arrive? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And now Jesus is gonna begin unpacking these two stories. How should they interpret these two stories of the, what happened with the bread and what happened with the water? How, how are they to receive Jesus? He doesn't wanna be made king, but he wants to teach them how to receive him. And this is where he begins zeroing in on this idea of hunger. Verse 26, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. He says, you're here because you're hungry. You ate the loaves yesterday, and because that food moves through pretty quickly, you're hungry again, you want more loaves. He says, but don't work for the food that perishes, but rather for the food that endures to eternal life. And now Jesus is beginning a conversation where he's really unpacking what human hunger is like. And he says, essentially, that you're here because you're hungry. And it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to be physically hungry, but now Jesus is gonna to try to lift their eyes to perceive a deeper appetite. A deeper appetite. And when Jesus is speaking about their hunger, he's reminding them that they're dependent people. How long can we live without food? How long can our bodies survive without water or without air. You see, God made us, God designed us to be dependent. He put Adam and Eve in the garden and he said, you can eat from any tree except for that one tree. You can eat from any tree, but you're gonna have to eat from trees. You're not this self-sufficient, self-sustaining thing. You're dependent. And Jesus now is taking that understanding of physical dependence. We have to have food. And he's beginning to apply it because the exact same thing is true of our spirit, of our soul. In the same way that our physical stomach craves sustenance and food, so also our soul, our spirit, the deepest part of us, craves sustenance. And what is it? What is it that can satisfy or nourish our spirit and soul? Well, it's trust. It's something to trust in. It's something to believe in. And Jesus, with these crowds, is helping them understand that their spirit, their soul, is hungry. They're seeking something to trust. And actually, it's interesting because whenever we're angry, depressed, sad, those kind of emotions, that's very similar to our physical stomach rumbling. When we're feeling that deep hollowness or barrenness of spirit, it's typically because our souls are hungry for something to trust in that will satisfy. Now it's interesting as well because hungry people will eat just about anything. 
When you get to that point of real hunger with your physical stomach, it's bad news because you might just eat whatever's nearby. Have you ever done this? I work from home some days of the week and, and I'll just kind of be working. All of a sudden it's three o'clock and I haven't had anything since breakfast and I go into the kitchen and I kind of am like a ravenous person, you know, and I kind of, kind of wandering around and there's a brownies. Amy made brownies. Bless God for my wife, you know? <laughs> and I just come over there and I just start eating. And, and, and like before you know it, I'll have pounded like 11 or 12 or 13 brownies, you know? <laughs> Just because I'm hungry and hungry people eat any. Have you guys ever done this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's funny because your appetite actually outstrips your capacity to eat brownies. So really you only were hungry for about four brownies worth of whatever's in the brownie. But then you ate 12 and then you kind of go, oh no. What did I just consume? Too much is what I, or maybe going to the grocery store. Have you ever gone to the grocery hungry? You end up coming home with so much stuff. Hungry people would consume anything. And this is the spiritual condition. This is what Jesus wants us to understand. Our spirits, our souls operate the same way, but our hunger is for something to trust in. And this is what happens in our culture. We see people, they're grasping around. What can I trust in? Maybe myself. Just rely on yourself, work harder, try harder, you can make yourself better. Or or maybe you're searching around for the next self-help thing or who's got the answer that it can help me lose weight or can help me make be happy. Who's got it? Or some religion, oh, maybe maybe the Buddhists have it. Maybe the Hindus have it. Maybe, Maybe this tradition has it. People are searching and they will consume anything. I think a perfect example is the movie that's opening this weekend. Fifty Shades of Grey. I'm sure you've seen the ads or stuff on TV. The title of the movie is Fifty Shades of Grey, but our response as Jesus followers is pretty black and white. (laughs) I can't think of any good reason to go see it. But why? Why why is that? I said one of the previews, a hundred million people are into it or whatever, bought the book. Why is it such a big phenomenon? It's because people's souls are hungry. what, What can I find? What can I trust in that will make me feel alive? How can I make it in the world? What, maybe this kind of story, maybe this kind of love or something like that will be what brings the spark back. Jesus is saying, don't seek the food that perishes. You consume that stuff and it's like eating 12 brownies, you feel rotten and you're not nourished. You gotta find something to trust. You gotta find something that will nourish your spirit and your soul. So verse 28, they ask him, it's the right question, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. Now Jesus, if you notice, he corrects their question just a little bit. They say, what can we do? What's what's our work? Jesus says, no, this is the work of God. God does it, not us. They say, we want to be doing the works of God. Jesus says, nope, there's just one work of God. They want to do something. How can we do the works of God? Jesus says, "Uh uh-uh, believing. It's not something to be done, but it's about believing. The work of God is belief, is trust in what? The one who he has sent. Now that word believe It shows up a lot in the Gospel of John. And I think at times we can miss the meaning of it because often we'll use the word believe in our everyday conversation to talk about believing in the existence of something. So people say, well, do you believe in aliens? Or do you believe in Bigfoot? No, no. But then do you believe in God? And people can say, yes. You know, I hear people all the time. Yeah, I believe in God. And what they often mean is I believe that God exists. It has no impact on my everyday life, but I believe in God. Sure, yeah, he's up there. Jesus is talking about something much deeper than simply acknowledging the existence of God. He's talking about trusting, believing in. The word in the original language can be translated trust, but it carries the idea of believing in something so much that you will do, you will act in response. This is what Jesus is saying. The work of God, the singular thing that nourishes the hunger of our souls is trust in the one who God has sent in Jesus. Now he goes on to develop this idea. 
Verse 30, they said to him, well, what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Basically, why should we trust you? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. I mean, they got bread every day for 40 years and there were hundreds of thousands of them. You got us bread one time. Why should we trust in you? Verse 32, Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. A beautiful line. If you want something to pray this week from the scripture, maybe just underline that sentence. Make it your prayer. Lord, sir, give us this bread always. Every moment. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. What promises? But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, in some of these sermons that Jesus preaches in the Gospel of John, you can get into them and you kind of lose track of what's going on. Now, the Father's giving something, but we're supposed to receive, and Jesus is the bread. How does this all fit together? Let me unpack this kind of simply for you. What's Jesus saying here? First, he's saying that whoever comes to him he satisfies. Second, he's saying the very act of people coming to him is not entirely in the hands of people, but actually God is the one who draws. A little bit later, a few verses later, he'll say, no one comes to me unless my father draws him. So you have the work of God doing it, but then you also have the choice of people to receive Jesus. And, and God's heart is for all these people to come and to know Jesus. You have both of these going on at the same time. This is one of the great debates in the history of, of the church. Which is it? Is God just predestining everybody to do exactly what he programs them to do? Or does he give us free will to make our own decisions in life? Or how do those things play together? And the answer here, as we see in this passage, so perfectly balanced, is that both are true at the same time. God is at work sovereignly, in the lives and the hearts of people, and people have freedom to make choices. How does that play out? They're just both true. I remember a few years ago, I was working with the college ministry here at Grace, and a young guy came up to me, and he was at that age and stage of his faith where he was um, very spiritually confident. Have you ever met like 22-year-olds kind of in that stage, 20-year-olds, like they read one book and they have it all figured out. <laughs> and so he came up, he wanted to have this big discussion about predestination and oh, like all like that. So he kind of started getting into it with me and he was like, how does this all work? And I remember looking around and there were like two pebbles on the ground. So I just picked up the pebbles and I said, here, just take these, pick one. And he looked at me, he's like, hey, we're talking about theology, why are you holding pebbles in front of me? You know, kind of that face, very spiritually confident. I said, just pick one. So he picked the one on his right and he held it. And I said, what did you just do? He said, I picked a pebble. I said, yeah, you made a choice. Now, did God know you were going to pick that pebble? Well, probably. Yeah, probably. Probably he did. But as far as you're concerned, you just made a choice, right? Yeah, I made a choice. I said, okay, that's how it works. <laughs> he gave me this look. So well balanced here. Jesus is showing, yeah, God's, he's in control. He's at work. At the same time, we have, we have choices to respond to Jesus, to receive Jesus, to trust Jesus, the work of God. So now verse 41, the Jews are grumbling about Jesus because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? They don't, they don't like this idea of, of Jesus being so singular, 
What, this is the one guy? This is the one place we're supposed to look for? You know, people in the world, they have this problem still. What, who are you saying Jesus is the only way? Are you really so exclusive? Jesus is pretty clear. He wants people to trust him because he is the only bread of life. Verse 43, Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. Some people read that verse and they think, what? Well, how do I know if the Father's drawn me? If you have ever had any desire to know about Jesus or trust Jesus, that's the Father drawing you, okay? If you're even asking that question, how do I know if the Father's drawing me? He's drawing you. (laughs) Verse 47, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Here Jesus is talking about his coming gift, laying down his life on the cross. This bread is my flesh. And the Jews disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus now is beginning to turn up the heat. Not only is he saying... I am the one who satisfies your soul. He's now saying you have to eat my flesh. They think he's talking about cannibalism. So Jesus said to them, verse 53, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Oh man, now these guys are having a hard time understanding what Jesus is talking about because in the original language, Jesus doesn't just say eat, he says feeds. And that word feed is the same kind of word that you would use to describe like a dog chewing on some meat. It means like munch or chomp. Jesus says, not only, you don't just have to eat my flesh, you've got to munch, munch, munch me. You've got to chomp, chomp, chomp. If you're like, what in the world? I'm out of here, I can't do that. And then Jesus shows us what he's talking about. Whoever feeds on my flesh, munch, 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 chomp, chomp, chomp on my flesh, and drinks my blood, abides in me, and I in him. He's not talking about literal eating of his flesh. He's talking about trust. He says, these words are spirit and these words are life. I'm teaching you what it looks like, what it means to be satisfied in your soul by choosing to trust me. Our souls are seeking something to trust, someone to trust. And Jesus says, your trust should be placed in me. That is how you satisfy the hunger of your soul, the hunger of your spirit. Trust me. And not just a one time, okay, I trusted you, no big deal. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we hear about the good news of Jesus. And if you put your trust in Jesus, then you won't go to hell when you die, you go to heaven. Say, okay, great, I'll trust Jesus for that. That's important, that's a start. But often it's easier in our day-to-day existence to trust Jesus for that than it is to begin trusting him for everything else. Because that's after we die. Everything else is right now today. What does it look like to begin trusting Jesus? Chomp, 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 munch, munch, munch. Lord, I trust you now with my money, with my family, with my work, with my friendships, with my future, with whoever it is you've picked out for me to marry, with my school. What does it look like to trust Jesus in all those areas? Jesus is saying it's very simple. It's just one thing is the work of God, trusting me. But trusting him means trusting him in our whole lives as the true Lord, as the one sent from heaven who has insight and knowledge and direction for us. That's so offensive. Everyone walks away except for the 12. And Jesus says, are you gonna go too? Peter replies, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The test now, finally, at the end of the chapter, has come full circle. And here the disciples, even though they don't fully understand the significance of what Jesus is talking about, the disciples say, we trust you, Lord. 
your words are eternal life. Eating the bread of life means trusting Jesus. So the question we need to wrestle with this morning is, how are we trusting Jesus? In order to satisfy our physical hunger, most of us eat three meals a day. Many of us try to drink eight cups of water a day. We're breathing, I hope, right now. Habitually. We, we build into our lives habitual rhythms that we might be fed and nourished physically. What does it look like to receive Jesus? What, what does it mean to feed our spirit by trusting in the bread of life? To stop and to listen to him. To seek his counsel and guidance. To be saturated in his words, in his scripture. There are a few practical things. One of them is communion. Jesus, the night before he was crucified, said, here, eat this bread, it's my body. Eat this, drink this cup, it's, it's my blood. And so for generations, the church has celebrated communion as a physical way of acknowledging our trust in Jesus. Taking communion regularly reminds us, okay, yes, we are trusting not on what we've done, but what on, he, what, on what, what he does. Another thing, this week, Aaron mentioned it in the announcements, we have Ash Wednesday coming up. It's the church calendar kickoff to the season of Lent. Ash Wednesday is simply a day to come together and remember that apart from the breath of God, we're just dust. We're ash, totally dependent on God. Come back and remember that built into the church calendar, this idea. And then Lent, moving forward, often people will take some time during those 40 days leading up to Easter for Lent to set aside a type of food or something else. And then in the space of that, to turn the heart toward the Lord. Because the point isn't the fast, the point is the Lord. During the season of Lent, it's a great time to carve out a little space to actively and habitually trust the Lord in a particular area of life. Maybe it's just as simple as praying at meals. Maybe just link trusting the Lord to eating. Whenever you eat, stop for a moment. Okay, Lord, trust you. What does it look like to trust you this afternoon, this day? And so we'll finish with this because... Because trust works as it, as it engages all the areas of our lives. As I mentioned, we were in Arizona last week. And one of the fun things we got to do was meet with an, an old friend who part of his job is to travel around the world and check in on these movements of Muslims who are coming to Christ. Awesome job. And he came back and he was telling us, we got to meet up with him in Arizona, and he was telling us about a couple of these movements that he had seen. One of the movements was a group that actually had 5,000 people raise their hand and respond to Christ to come to faith. But it's interesting because these Muslims who raised their hand, of these 5,000, only 1,000 trusted the Lord to the point of getting baptized. And of those 1,000, only 200 we're still connected to any kind of fellowship or community that was saturating in the words of Jesus. He's talking about this and he says, okay, so here, out of 5,000, you have 200 people who are actually actively trusting Jesus. And what have the rest done? We don't know that their, their eternal destiny or however that's worked, but by the very least, we could say in their minds, they feel like, yeah, I trusted Jesus, but they're probably not living in the fullness of soul satisfaction because they're not trusting him, munching on him, walking with him every day. It's one simple work of God, trusting Jesus. But when you trust Jesus, you're trusting him all the way. On the flip side, our friend said he went to see another movement in a village. And he said, among this people group in the villages, wherever Christ has been planted and has grown up and there are these communities, he said, at the center of the village, they keep a book. And in that book, they keep a list of every scripture that they've read together as believers and how they're going to obey it. That's what it looks like to trust Jesus. They hear the words 
hey, if Jesus is trustworthy, then we need to do it. We need to obey it. It's very simple, trusting the Lord. Very complicated and challenging. At the end of the day, trust comes down to trustworthiness. Jesus reminds us in this passage, my blood, my body is given for you. He reminds them, even here, before the crucifixion, he reminds us here of the crucifixion that he lays down his life. You know, when it comes to trusting someone, we, we tend to trust people who we feel like have our interests in mind. But all kinds of people who we trust at some point do something selfish or turn their back on us or say, actually, I'm gonna do all that, sorry. And some of us have had our trust trampled so many times that it's really difficult to extend it anywhere. And what Jesus is saying is that you can trust me. How do you know? Because I laid down my life for you. To the very end, to the very last breath, I was not selfish. I did not seek my own needs. I laid down my life for you. The ultimate stamp of trustworthiness. It's a silly illustration. I was working on this stuff and I was just writing the word trust. You might want to write it on your sheets, the word trust. It kind of helped me remember. In our English language, when you write the word trust, it starts and ends with the cross. (laughs) I mean, it's just a T, but for me personally, when I'm looking at it, I see it begins, yes, Lord, you laid down your life for me, I trust you. But then every single day as we walk through Can we trust the Lord? He's the only one who satisfies our soul. Yes, all the way through, every day of our lives, beginning to end, trust. He is trustworthy as he lays down his life for us and was raised again. Let's pray.